Obi-Wan Kenobi, to put it simply, killed Star Wars for me. Now, this didn't come out of nowhere, it's not like this was the first bad Star Wars thing ever, and I'm so taken aback that the franchise is dead to me. No, this was the last nail in a coffin that's been lowering into the ground for the better part of a decade. Although there's the odd spark of greatness here and there, Star Wars as a whole has lost its heart and soul to the rat in big yellow shoes. Disney has a knack for sucking creativity, passion, and authenticity out of media in favour of a cookie-cutter, safe approach to filmmaking and nowhere is it more prevalent than Star Wars. I'm not talking about canon, I'm not talking about their forced woke agenda or whatever nonsense you want to call it. I'm not even talking about the direction of the plot because two out of three of those things are heavily founded in subjectivity. Now I'm not here to say this video is objective fact, obviously no perception of art is objective, although I would find it a push to call this art. Now if you've already gone down to the comments to combat my stance about this show, hold on a minute. Recently over on my podcast, my co-host and I had a debate about Obi-Wan Kenobi. Both of us holding opposite opinions. It made for a pretty interesting discussion and something you might be interested in if you want to see someone try to retort my position on the show. Although he is completely wrong and I'm of course objectively right. Link in the description to As Always Podcast episode 164 if you're interested. However, I do believe that genuine criticism of something should aim to have objective backing, meaning what you're stating is grounded in factual writing theory. I'm not trying to get too philosophical into what objective truly means, but I do think that as a people we sort of value particular writing techniques and the quality to which they are executed. We understand what character writing is, we understand what a character arc is, we understand what a well-written plot is, it just varies from person to person where our own marker for it being good is. For me, all of those elements that make up Obi-Wan's writing are very, very poor. I've not felt so insulted by a piece of media in a while, a piece of media that I had hoped so badly was good. As bad as the prequels are, and yeah, they are still bad, I love them, because when I was a kid, before I could think critically, I loved them. Sure, they don't make sense, sure the characters are inconsistent, sure the arcs are rushed and messy, but fuck me, that was my Star Wars. And despite all those flaws, I'll always have a connection to them. To find out Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen were coming back for the one Star Wars thing I'd wanted since Disney took over, I was so excited. So excited that I didn't even consider it could be bad. So this video doesn't come from a place of hate or a place of malice, it comes from a place of love passion and frustration at everything this series could have been but sadly wasn't. And if you like it, fair enough. That's cool for you. But I don't think any of the criticism I level against it here being addressed would make the show worse. If you find yourself annoyed that I want the show to be better, that's a weird thing to be angry about. I'm sure you've never felt let down by a film or series before. I'm not going to argue to change direction or to alter entire elements to remove characters because that's not criticism, that's simply saying you'd have preferred something completely different in design. I'm simply going to take what we have and criticise the quality of writing, whether for plot or character. I personally still believe you can keep Vader, Reva, Leia, Tala, maybe not Haja, no, I could make him work. So I want to explore a few elements of the show. Feel free to use the timestamps either to skip over segments or to watch the video in bits, whatever you want. But the goal is to look at character individually and their relationships, to look at their approach to plot, how it's strung together from beat to beat, how these two conflate with one another, and to address the Disney Plus formatting of the show. How that affects general quality, filmmaking, and how the six episode format doesn't really cut it. Let's start with the latter. Disney Plus is really something we've never seen before. Sure, we have Netflix, we have Amazon Prime, but the way Disney managed their Marvel and Star Wars properties through Disney Plus is something brand new. Originally, I was excited for this. I thought it'd be great to see more content, some actual in-depth shows for major players in the Star Wars and Marvel universes. But it quickly became apparent to me that what they're making on Disney Plus are not traditional television programs. They're events essentially low-budget films that are stretched to four to five hours and then split up into individual parts. What this does is it means we're not getting a TV show. Ten episodes a season with an hour for each episode to properly structure and tell a story that could be watched episode by episode as the pacing allows for in a TV show format. But we're also not getting a tight two to two and a half hour film that very nicely tells a well-paced story that can be viewed in a single sitting. We're getting this in between, where really it's a long, stretched-out film that's made on a much lower budget that is then cut up and drip fed to us so that we keep our Disney Plus subscription active. Now this might work for you, you might not care, and I mean it's hardly my biggest criticism, but 
I think it's something that actively works against Obi-Wan Kenobi, because the story really isn't episodic in structure and pacing. It's one long story that's been cut up. Look at The Mandalorian, for example. Season 1 was simple, but it was certainly episodic. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of The Mandalorian, but that's not necessarily because it's poorly written, it's just not really for me as a show. But being structured in a traditional TV show format, helps it to be successful. You can watch it one episode at a time. Each episode tells a singular story that does carry into the next, but also has something specific to say in that one episode. A contained story that has character development for the season, as well as building an overarching narrative. Obi-Wan is a movie that is being made on a much lower budget, but is several hours longer than a normal theatrical cut, and then is being split into multiple parts and given to us week to week under the guise of being a TV show. Now I'm mentioning this because it means the story can't have one beginning, middle, and end. Each third would be too long, so it has to meander. They know where they want it to begin, and they know where they want it to end, but rather than having a compelling hour in between to grow character and have a few action pieces to build to the third act, they spend four episodes dawdling. It makes sense because it recently came out that Obi-Wan was meant to be a film trilogy, and the events of this show were supposed to be the first movie. Supposedly, the original script was taken by a new writer and stretched out to be six episodes, and it shows, because it's quite shocking how the middle portion is wildly lower in quality than episode 1 and even episode 6, but to a lesser degree. I do feel that there are also other elements to being on Disney Plus that work against the show, but a lot of that is far more up to your own personal taste and where your own filmmaking bad threshold is. For me, I felt that a lot of set design and costume design felt cheap and flat. The first time we see clone armor for real on screen, it looks really fake and plasticky. The lightsabers seem to bounce off things, it should really be slicing through stormtroopers. The prequels managed to do it, so I don't know why Disney refused to use lightsabers properly now. What killed this guy? He just has some small cuts in his armor, like how did he die? The use of stagecraft means although the backgrounds look better, unlike The Mandalorian, Obi-Wan doesn't seem to care about utilizing lighting properly to make shots convincing. It feels like they're just standing on a film set and stagecraft seems to restrict what they can do with their camera. Every shot seems to be done with a similar lens and a similar angle, making most shots look bland, uninspired and overall boring. That could be stagecraft restricting them, or maybe the director just hates her job, I don't know. <laughs> but you surely can't tell me that this shot looks good. It lingers for so long, it looks like a fan film shot on an iPhone, I can't take it seriously. But like I said, this stuff is way, way more about your own personal taste and what matters to you when looking at a screen, and it's really not the main focus of my issues. That all comes from the writing, so why don't we take a little look at that. Now the show wasn't all bad, which might sound like an odd way to begin a critique called the show that killed Star Wars, but this is meant to be an honest analysis of the show's quality, and that means also acknowledging that it isn't a total mess, although most of it is. It's worth looking at how the opening to the show actually managed to establish a lot of good. It justified its plot well and worked to characterize all the major players. After the first episode, I was on board and ready to enjoy the show. I do just wish it continued at this level. It's still not insanely deep, but at least competent. It's worth looking at episode 1 as the marker for how the show managed to get things right, so that when we look at where it fell flat, it makes even more sense. One of the reasons why it's frustratingly bad in particular is because episode 1 is pretty good. It makes the show falling off so hard even more infuriating. Episode 1 isn't totally void of problems though, and I will touch on those later, but for now, let's talk about the positive foundation. Episode 1 does some great, great foundation building for both story and for character. It makes it feel like the driving force of this show will be character, as it should be when you're telling a prequel story with characters from the original thing. You can't have it be plot-focused because we all know how it turns out. So you could have plot, but the engagement should come from character depth, growth, and introspection off the back of a plot. Something I think they aim to do, but it feels very much like the plot ended up getting in the way, and lots of the character moments we were meant to see got shafted for trying to figure out how to get the characters from A to B quickly. You want things that allow us as the viewer to see the characters in a different way, and build towards what comes next. If you have it all be about plot, then there's no substance there because it's all, oh, 
I hope they don't die when we all know they don't die. So it would be bad to do that. You know, 11 times. Episode 1 opens with Order 66 from Revenge of the Sith, which works as a great way to establish this major Star Wars event as a key plot point for every major character involved. Kenobi, Vader, and Reva, without upfront just telling us Reva was there, which is actually done quite well, although they do have Palpatine saying, Order 66. In case we didn't know what was happening, even though all of the foundation for the latter payoffs of the show seem to rely solely on you having actually seen the prequels, because otherwise you'd feel nothing for these characters, but we'll get there. The rest of the episode is entirely focused on character building and establishing their plot. It takes its time, it doesn't rush, it doesn't focus on fighting, it really just spends its length fleshing out our characters and where they're at at this point in their lives. It's wonderful, and I really want to go through in order and explain how each each major character is established, Obi-Wan, Leia, and finally, Reva. They really work in this episode to characterise Obi-Wan as a broken man, someone who has lost all faith, maybe out of guilt, maybe out of regret, maybe out of selfish reasons. You'd think, potentially, that's an avenue of character to explore. Wouldn't you? We get to follow Obi-Wan on his daily routine, his way of blending in. The same commute every day, the same job with a boss who sucks, the same dreams every night about his friend, his brother who he couldn't save. The flashbacks to Anakin help to solidify that Obi-Wan is still struggling with that loss, with what he could have done differently to save Anakin. It very subtly works it into the character story that Obi-Wan still thinks of Anakin every night and it haunts him, so that eventually, that moment when he finds out Vader is alive, hits us, and him, hard. We see that he's struggling to keep in the shadows, so that means that despite his lack of faith and abandonment of the Jedi and the Force, he still is a good person. He wants to try and help people. Please, I have a family. One more word, I take it all. Something you want to say? Although I will say I find it difficult to believe he's never dealt with this before. He seems really shocked that his boss would treat someone like that, but I would think it happens every day. It's not important, but I think it's a symptom of a larger problem of the show that the writer doesn't really consider everything about a scenario. Sometimes it's minor like this, and sometimes it's the forest scene with Leia. Anyway, the writer really bothers here to take time alone with Obi-Wan and give him ample reasoning to explain how he feels about the Jedi. A Jawa shows up and and has a Jedi belt wanting to sell it to him, and of course, that brings many emotions flooding back. You can see it on his face. Sadness, guilt, dread, and a little sparkle of hope. I've heard the Jedi are all but extinct. Yeah. Ewan's performance is what sells a lot of the dialogue in this show, whether it's well or poorly written, but in this instance, the moment allows us insight into where Obi-Wan is at mentally with regards to the Jedi. There's another moment later with the runaway Jedi in the desert where you can see that he wants to help, but he can't. Whether it's because he feels he's unable, he's scared of failing again, or a multitude of other reasons, he tells the Jedi to stay hidden. You'd hope that his motivations are more greatly explored over the series, but they're not. This is really just a surface level trait of reluctance to help for reasons that are never truly explored, at least not to any level of depth or character importance. Only shallow bits to keep the plot moving along and are resolved without any ounce of actual introspection to give us the appearance of a character arc just without showing us what's going on internally to any actual degree that matters. There's lots of little things they do, like him watching Luke try to pilot his house like a stupid kid, and the fear you see on Obi-Wan's face. Luke reminds him of Anakin. It's a parallel that works for Obi-Wan's character at this point in his life, and it doesn't shove it in our face. It's subtle and well integrated into the story. It's moments like this that hugely confuse me on why the rest of the show is so bad. I also just love that Obi-Wan seems to really love his EOP. Just look at that gaze. He loves this thing. It also has like crazy realistic CGI on 
honestly, I'm starting to think this is where the whole budget went. It would have been a ballsy gut punch to kill his beloved animal, but we always have season two, right, Disney? Now, Leia is a highlight of this episode, and one of the most disappointing parts of the show for me. She was so good in episode one, I almost cannot fault any scene that she was in other than you know, the obvious one. Leia is immediately characterized as someone desperate to leave home, to find a purpose for herself away from Alderaan, which is very Skywalker. Medical fighter, pleasure barge, boring. Xeno ship, not bad. Ooh, a tri-wing, that's a new one. Unicolian ranger, probably scouting for Mersan pirates. Although, I do think the parallel from Luke to Anakin wanting to leave Tatooine makes more sense because it's a terrible, awful planet. They live on a farm, Anakin was, was a slave. There's more reason there for Luke to want to leave. I can't really understand why Leia is so desperate to leave. Alderaan is very nice, she has a loving family. I guess it's because she doesn't have any interest in getting into politics, but I, even then, it doesn't feel like the parallel entirely works, but... I'll let that one slide. We see direct parallels to both Luke and Anakin, and they do work to give us an attachment to young Leia. We get to see hints of her force sensitivity, which, while a bit heavy-handed, is nice, all things considered. It could have been even more on the nose, you know? There's some great stuff with Bale, showing that Leia is a kid who definitely has it in her to lead one day, but that she's clearly just a kid right now. It feels like Leia, and I think that's a really tough job to do. Her relationship with her father is fantastic. You get moments that just hit so nicely, knowing what becomes of Leia and the tragedy that befalls Alderaan. I don't want to be a senator. Which is why you'll probably be one of the best. And boy, this scene also does so brilliantly what Rise of Skywalker was trying so hard to force for Rey. Not even a real Organa. Don't ever say that. You are a child. You are an Organa in every way. Again, it's crazy how this show fell apart. After starting so strong, it characterizes Leia as a smart kid. She's skeptical. She's not one to just blindly follow people or trust with no reason. She's got a good head on her shoulders, and you'll start to see that these traits just sort of fizzle out when the plot needs them to. I won't go into detail here, but it's worth keeping in mind for when we do get there. Reva is the last major character established in episode one, and... Dude, she is a standout for me in the opening. There's even some great subtleties to her performance that foreshadow and give clear cues to her backstory. Her backstory itself isn't very convincing and her actual plan is flimsy as all hell, but in a good story, there's some moments in episode one that work subtly to convey Reva is struggling. When the Grand Inquisitor is threatening the people in the saloon on Tatooine, Reva looks down. She appears to be trying to compose herself. It looks like rage seems to fuel her because then she throws the knife. She's brash. The other Inquisitors have to often pull her back and rein her in. You are reckless. Then we should be hunting bigger prey. You will forget this fixation with Kenobi or I will relieve you of your duties. Is that clear? Stand down, Dark Sister. It's a great setup because it makes the viewer wonder why is she so evil, so aggressive, so fueled by hate, so much so that the other Inquisitors need to keep stopping her, and although, like I said, her story pans out awfully, this episode doesn't do anything wrong with her for the most part, and Moses Ingram gives a brilliant performance. There's nuance, there's intimidation, she's pretty scary in some of these scenes with Owen. You protect your family. I like that, Owen. It's important. You think you could protect them from me? She commands your attention in this scene, and it's very strong. Reva is a mystery, yet formidable and tenacious. I really like her characterization in episode one, and if they bothered at all to try and give her backstory depth or her plan more credibility, they could have been onto something great here. The episode concludes with Obi-Wan leaving Tatooine after Leia is kidnapped and Bail asks him for help. There's some bits here that I will touch upon later, but for the purposes of this mainly positive chapter of the video, I'll gloss over them. The motivation for Obi-Wan to leave the planet is really strong. I thought it'd be a hard sell, but of course, the only reason he'd ever leave Luke is because of Leia. Like Bail says, She's as important as he is. Because they took their time to characterize Leia, to show us her family, her planet, and to show us Obi-Wan's torn mental state, him leaving the planet for Leia works. 
but this is where things start to go wrong. They set up everything so nicely in this episode, a foundation and a plot that allows for a bond to begin between Leia and Obi-Wan, a bond that should invoke introspection, that should allow for Obi-Wan to once again feel hope. Reva works as a catalyst to get Vader and Obi-Wan together, but while not being a mere plot device, having interesting history and depth to be explored as well. Obi-Wan's PTSD to be tackled, his growth from a hermit to the Obi-Wan we've seen in A New Hope to be written, and his relationship with Anakin to become a relationship with Vader. Everything was set up for a fucking home run. How did Joby Harold fuck this up? The crazy part is, Episode 6 does the conclusive chapter decently well. There's a few stumbles, and I won't lie, Reva's whole story made utterly no sense, but for the most part, Episode 6 concludes the stories how they probably should have been concluded, albeit without a great deal of depth. The problem is, these conclusions don't act as satisfying completions of story or character arcs because the writing between Episode 1 and 6 consists of the absolute bare minimum needed to convey an arc and in a lot of cases, characters simply slipping out of character to allow the plot to move forward. It's messy, it's disjointed, it's contrived, and often really, really silly. I felt so insulted by this, so let down, because episode 1 creates a foundation that is very strong, and it's like they built on top of it using sticks and mud, and then placed a stone roof on top, having the entire house come crashing down. So the roof is a good roof, but you can't really get the most out of a well-built roof unless the walls of the house are also strong. This is a really weird house metaphor, but I think it gets across the point that I'm making. Let's go ahead then, delve into the meat of the show. How does it fail our characters' arcs? How does it stumble with the main purpose? How does contrivance play a large part in the plot? And how do all of these elements together stop the show from being satisfying or meaningful to me? Obi-Wan's arc is probably the closest the show gets to serviceable, I think is the word I want. He starts one way, sad, lonely, having PTSD flashbacks, and he ends another way, smiling, saying hello there, riding into the sunset with Liam Neeson who they couldn't afford for more than 24 seconds. The problem, however, comes in how they get him from A to B. They spend a large majority of the show not actually doing that job at all. I can understand why people are satisfied with the character in this show because the way he ends, while sort of a bit heavy-handed, is where you'd expect him to end up. So in that instance, the job was done. Only, there was no job done. Obi-Wan just starts the show one way and ends the show another way. There isn't actually an arc written into these episodes that bridge the beginning and the end of his supposed arc, which is one of the major issues I take with the show. The start point is correct, and the end point is correct, but how he gets there is an absolute failure of character writing, which is why, to me, the ending isn't actually satisfying. It's frustrating. Character arcs should be mapped out incrementally. You maybe want 10 to 15 small beats between the start and end of an arc. These beats need to incrementally get our character from A to B. Think of them as A.1, A.2, A.3, all the way to A.10, and then, then it becomes B, character arc complete. This show, however, just has an A and a B, with one moment between the two that sort of is the cutoff, which is the end of episode 3. After the fight with Vader, Obi-Wan wakes up in episode 4 and is like, fuck yeah, let's do Obi-Wan shit. Up until that point, he'd been more like, fuck, no. Let's do Obi-Wan shit, I guess. Because he was still doing the same stuff, he was just less happy about it. And so, even the arc they're trying to portray, as surface level as it is, isn't even consistent with itself. Even during episode 1, there are inconsistencies though. He's supposed to be a broken man, fallen out of faith with the Force and with the Jedi. He believes the Jedi need to all go into hiding. There is no fight. He says as much. The fight is done. We lost. But in the same episode, he says this to Owen. When the time comes, he must be trained. I cannot understand why you wrote this, especially when he feels such deep regret over Anakin. Why would he be fighting to train Luke? The same man who refuses to help find Leia originally and will not help a pleading Jedi in the desert. The only reason they have him insist on training Luke is because they sort of said it in Revenge of the Sith, so he had to acknowledge it. But at the same time, they try to say, like, he's given up completely on everything. 
It feels a bit too black and white for a story like this. I think you can show a dedication to the Jedi and to Luke, but also a reluctance and fear for what could happen. You could easily illustrate this using Qui-Gon, who would have been the perfect outlet for us as an audience to see what's going on inside Obi-Wan's mind. A really good story reason for him to be openly voicing his inner conflict without it feeling contrived, and then giving us depth into how Qui-Gon feels about this whole ordeal as well as Anakin's fall. There are a ton of instances in this show where the characters will just stand around telling each other what their character arcs are. What happened to you? You were once a great Jedi. Yeah, I, yeah, I got that. You're not a Jedi anymore, Kenobi. You're just a man. Thanks for spelling it out, Bounty Hunter, who understands the writer's vision better than he can convey through actual meaningful writing. You seem kind of old and beat up. Nice, Leia. I now have noticed this distinct character trait. You? You really are a Jedi. <sighs> it's not about us, is it? You want to do it. It's about you and him. I am very glad we have this random side character to let us know exactly how Obi-Wan is feeling inside, rather than having it woven into the story in any way that is actually observable by us. The show insists on beating you over the head with the writer's intent without trying to bake it in naturally to the story or the show, and sometimes they just do both. They do this more times than I showed examples for, but you get the point. Rather than having Obi-Wan undergo an arc, they have characters just say he's undergone an arc. It's Lazy Writing 101. If we could actually see the arc taking place through meaningful character moments, they wouldn't need to keep spelling it out to us through obtuse dialogue. I think the arc they're trying to tell is that a broken Obi-Wan grappling with his grief and guilt over Anakin is confronted with his old friend and after a confrontation is able to reconcile that Anakin and Vader are two different people and he can let go of his guilt. This would work if they bothered to tell a story that used this as a central pillar. Obi-Wan, outside of Vader being directly relevant, never seems to show inner conflict, wavering, or a struggle outside of Episode 1. Unless Vader is on screen or mentioned, Obi-Wan doesn't seem to care about him, and a major reason is probably because of how unnecessarily complicated the plot is. With so many moving parts, side characters, and locations to get to, there is left almost no time to explore Obi-Wan's mental state through the lens of situations he finds himself in. Because if he acts in a way that could reflect what he's feeling, we might not be able to make it to the next story beat in time. And that's how we spend a lot of this series, pushing Obi-Wan from beat to beat with no room to breathe or explore his character. I'll be all right. Your body's not the only thing that needs to heal, Ben. Past is a hard thing to forget, and you just need time, that's all. Some things can't be forgotten. You care about Leia, then you're gonna have to try. This scene isn't a bad scene, but it has no weight because as soon as the scene is over, Obi-Wan's troubles exist no more. His actions, his dialogue, nothing in episode 4 is dictated by his mental state, which means there's no meaningful exploration of his character, which means there's no actual arc. He just does some cool Batman lightsaber stuff in the fortress and saves Leia again, risking life and limb like a Jedi does, because that's what he is. Even though the show tries to pretend he's yet to grow back into those Jedi boots, he has been for two episodes now. Episode 5 is all about Reaver's backstory and Obi-Wan leading the Rebels, which could have been a really impactful episode for the character, stepping back into the shoes of General Kenobi from the Clone Wars, if he hadn't been leading and commanding from the very start of the show. You must leave. Walk into the middle of the desert and bury it in the ground. Just that there's a lot of remotes and magnets. It looks like you just took money from that family. I... If I don't get back in time, go. I'll be right behind you, I promise. Go with Tala. I'll be right behind you. Look at it, Alderaan. Promise me. Promise me. I'll lead him away. Or someone very important to me has been taken. I need your help to get her back. We could take those speeders, go in at night. You have some T-47s in the hangar. So we need to find a way inside. By the end of episode 6, after his fight with Vader, which we'll get onto later, he has become the optimistic Obi-Wan from the original trilogy, which is odd given Obi-Wan from the original trilogy calls himself Ben and is a hermit. Well, I don't know anyone named Obi-Wan. Old Ben lives out beyond the Dune Sea. He's kind of a strange old hermit. Not really an archetypal Jedi Knight, but maybe the second season will explain how he falls back into hermitry and why Luke calling him Obi-Wan awakens something in him almost like he never had this story happen to him at all. The problem with Obi-Wan's arc isn't the arc itself. The concept works, it's just the execution has no depth or even any real standing in the show. The first two episodes deal with him becoming a Jedi again, the rest of the show simply meanders until its climax. I think Ewan McGregor's performance sells it a lot, he manages to channel different mindsets for each episode and although the writing doesn't really back it up, you can sort of pretend he's got an arc going for him just by the way Ewan delivers the terrible dialogue and carries himself in general, which I think goes a long way in making people who like the show, like the show.
Now, Reva is apparently very easy to hate. I hear just the fact that Moses Ingram was in the show pisses a lot of dumb people off. Now, there are a lot of valid reasons to criticise Reva's character, and believe me, I will. But Moses Ingram is not one of them. She's a fantastic actress, especially good in not Star Wars things that have a good script, like her role in The Queen's Gambit. She did her very best with the poor script she was given, same as Ewan did. The fact Ewan had to make a video telling off some Star Wars fans for their abuse towards her online is... Embarrassing. It seems that some of the fan base have decided to attack Moses Ingram online and send her the most horrendous racist DMs. I just want to say, as the leading actor in the series, as the executive producer on the series, we stand with Moses. We love Moses. And if you're sending her bullying messages, you're no Star Wars fan in my mind. And so I want to make it clear my criticism of Reva's character is not in any way indicative of how I feel about Moses Ingram. She's had enough to deal with, and I want to say I think she did the best she could, and she's a talented actress who I hope to see in many more things. The issues fall on the writing team. I think her character was established relatively well, at least on a character basis as I described earlier on. One of the main reasons I feel people didn't gel with her from the get-go is because of how the writers seem to try and make her feel more important than maybe she is. And there are good ways to go about trying to make a character feel important to a story without doing what they did here. It's usually done through really bad contrivances. Things like Reva just knowing Owen is the one to interrogate in this scene, almost like she knows who the main characters are, managing to find this secret hatch to a secret secret tunnel in one of the many buildings within this settlement, and then just finding a faster route to the end of the tunnel to capture Leia, knowing to plant a tracker sneakily on Leia's droid even though she had no intention of letting her escape, or even knowing that Kenobi was in the base at that time, some insane foresight, or even just realising Tala is a spy right off the bat. She's almost too clever, clever in ways that feel like she's read the script. It begins to break down immersion and ruin the story, knowing that no matter what the heroes do, Reva will figure it out because the plot needs her to. I think that's probably why people don't like her character. They find her annoying not because she is annoying, but because the way she's written into the plot is annoying. But most people can't put their finger on exactly why that is because most people aren't overanalyzing TV shows like I am. They just know there's something they don't like, and it comes from Reva, which equals Reva bad, basically. Let's lay out Reva's arc, though. Reva was a youngling during Order 66. Her friends were killed by Anakin during the massacre at the Jedi Temple, and she was stabbed. We know this because there's a parallel as Vader stabs her, which makes it pretty clear, but also, in Episode 3, she holds her gut like she's remembering an old memory, and I think that indicates where she was stabbed, but only in hindsight. On a first watch, it means nothing, and you'll probably forget it anyway. She survived because plot, and wasn't found because she hid in a bunch of their bodies. I guess it really is that easy. Because of this, she harbors a lot of hatred for Anakin and wants him dead, which makes sense, and I'm with her. Now, I'm gonna throw this hot take out here, or it could be cold, I don't know. I think we should have known Reva's motives from the very start. Now, hear me out. Think of every scene with Vader, with the Inquisitors, confronting Tala, even interrogating Leia, but imagine we know who she really is. How much more depth would there be? How much more tension when she's kneeling before Vader knowing how much hatred she has for him? It would make for some brilliant scenes. But instead, we're kept in the dark for four and a half of the six episodes, and it leaves them one and a half to flesh her out, give her depth, and wrap up her arc. That's not happening. If we'd known from the start, you could have given us so many more moments of conflict within her, leaning in more to the dark side to banish any thoughts of giving up, struggling with who she is, and maybe her parallel to Vader by the end might have actually worked. There's still a lot to Reva that doesn't make a lot of sense. Her plan to kill Vader was so convoluted, kidnapping Leia, who she doesn't even know is that important, to lure out Obi-Wan to capture him, to bring him to Vader, but then also for Vader to be alone, and for her to still be in the room, for Vader to be distracted by Obi-Wan long enough for her to kill him, and then... I don't know. Her plan doesn't work, of course, but not because it's a dumb plan, because Vader already knew. But when did he know? Did the Grand Inquisitor tell him, or did they plan it before that? Vader says, Did you really believe I did not see it? Youngling. Which implies to me, he always knew? Like, he remembers her as a kid, which means why the fuck did he ever make her an Inquisitor? Was he really playing a 10 year long game so that he could lose Kenobi anyway? What was the point in any of this? 
at this point, they've got to not be reading their scripts. How does this not get rewritten in some way? So she gets stabbed, and obviously she survives it again. I'm sure by this point, Qui-Gon is very unhappy that he's the only person to ever be killed by a lightsaber in Star Wars. But this is where Reva's story gets incredibly messy. She picks up a communicator thing that just happened to be dropped, that happens to have information about Luke on it. You know the drill. Plot convenience galore. And she decides she's gonna recover from being stabbed in the gut with a lightsaber. And head to Tatooine to murder Luke, because I, th beats me. Revenge towards Obi-Wan? A simple, sorry Reva, I was on a giant lizard in Utapal when Anakin killed your friends, I couldn't help, but I wish that I could, seriously would have cleared up a lot of confusion. So she goes to Tatooine, attacks the Lars homestead, it's mental, and after a long old chase, she goes to kill Luke. Will she do it? Will Luke die? No, of course she won't. Have you seen Star Wars before? She brings Luke back, and Obi-Wan, who's gotten back to Tatooine very quickly, forgives her. I think it's supposed to mirror Anakin. Obi-Wan has more patience now, and so he can do right by her rather than condemning her, but, like, he already got over his guilt and realized his guilt was misplaced because it was Vader who killed Anakin, and actually he wasn't to blame, so this parallel doesn't really pay off anything. In a better story, this line might have even worked. Have I become him? Overall, I think Reva easily got the worst written part of the show. They tried to make her a real major player in the series, but didn't give her enough depth to warrant it until episode 5, at which point they had no real time to actually flesh her out, and in a show about Obi-Wan who already didn't get enough time to be properly explored, this entire subplot probably could have been cut and replaced with more meaningful moments between Obi-Wan and Leia to develop a real bond and connection rather than the few minor moments we get spread across the series. Speaking of Leia, she is incredibly underutilized in this series. I think the actress was marvelous, she's absolutely adorable, and really manages to capture Leia in an interesting way. The writing for episode 1 for Leia, like I said, is really good. It makes you care for her. It harkens back or forward to the original trilogy. It pulls on your heartstrings using Bale and Brea Organa, and it's overall just really solid, other than you know. Now, they do add well to her character during episode 2. There's some wobbles, but overall, they continue to develop what they had. A key component they solidify is Leia's intelligence. When she first is rescued by Obi-Wan, she says, I'm gonna get you out of here. Why should I trust you? Would you rather stay here? Showing that she doesn't necessarily trust him, but it's currently her only means of escape. Following this, we get a moment where even Obi-Wan points out she's clever. Again, it's the characters berating us with character traits we need to notice, even though it's right there in front of us, but, you know. You I think the less you say, the less you give away. But really, it's the opposite. How old are you? Ten. You don't sound like you're ten. And then we get the moment that springs us into another stupid chase scene that looks dumb, but it's Leia seeing the wanted hologram for Obi-Wan. This is the point where she feels it's too big of a risk to continue hanging around him. She'd be better off getting away and trying to find her own way back to Alderaan, something that is sort of dumb but is in keeping with her character so far, this independence and non-reliance on adult figures. Now this establishes she very astutely doesn't trust everyone at face value. She asks lots of questions, trying to discern someone's true motives and feels unsafe if they are hiding something. So then we get to episode three. Why would he lie? Um, uh, okay. Well, at least she doesn't decide to blindly trust a random driver on an Imperial occupied planet. What are you doing? Maybe they can give us a ride to the spaceport. But it's not safe. It seems friendly. Oh. This is where Leia loses pretty much any semblance of character in favor of plot. She trusts the driver because the plot needs them on the transport so they can meet Tala. Sure, once she's on the transport, she sort of falls back into character a bit. I like that she's very good at lying her way out of situations, even if they do have to neuter Obi-Wan's own ability to get her there. Although after this transport ride, that's where Leia just dips. She's relegated to running through a tunnel, being kidnapped again, inexplicably being able to repair rebel circuitry to move the plot forward with absolutely no time for character, and so the start of episode 6 where Leia and Obi-Wan say their goodbyes, although pretty good in of itself, I have no complaints about the actual scene, it's built on a foundation of not a lot. It's one and a half episodes of time spent together, because when you look at it, it's their time together in episode 2, and the first half of episode 3. Other than that, Leia and Obi-Wan don't spend a lot of time together. They have brief moments, but most of it is plot focused, and there is nowhere near enough time to grow the relationship they're trying to say they have by episode 6. I 
just don't buy it. They've spent more time away from each other than they have in each other's presence over the whole series, and although I can understand why Leia would latch onto him, it's what kids do, I can't really understand why Obi-Wan cares so much about her, other than how he already unconditionally did. It means when Obi-Wan has his Spider-Man homecoming moment under the rubble, you cannot run. I don't buy that Leia would be what would give him the strength to get out. They have not had the time to build a connection strong enough that this makes any sense. I get what the show was trying to do, it just didn't do it. Now, if Obi-Wan had thought about his EOP during this moment, dude, that would have brought me to tears. That'd be much more compelling of a reason to lift the rocks. You cannot run. Sadly, I think that Leia was underused, sidelined, and ultimately written in as a plot device to force Obi-Wan's arc to completion and get him from A to B in plot terms. All of this is so underdeveloped and half-baked that it renders any payoffs, like the origins of Leia's holster, entirely mundane. On a side note though, why does Disney feel like we need an origin to everything? First, Han Solo's name, then Leia's holster, like... Is this what people consider satisfying? Having every piece of canon filled in like a Wikipedia entry? I was going to make a joke about them doing an origin story about where Luke's yellow jacket came from at the end of A New Hope, giving it added meaning. But dude, at this point, I wouldn't even put it past them. It was C-3PO. He, he made it. Now to the meat of this show, to the part that everyone heralds as its saving grace the conflict between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader. Although there are merits to this aspect of the show, I will give it that, I feel the depth to which it is explored is severely lacking. I hate to say this because I know a lot of people just love the battle in episode 6, but for me, a battle is nothing without meaning given to it by the story being told prior to the fight. The fight at the end of episode 6 was meant to be a culmination of the show's narrative and character arcs, and sadly, it is not that. It feels like it exists in a vacuum. The show meanders for four episodes and then realises there has to be a fight, and so it does the fight. It doesn't at any point feel like a meaningful culmination of the events before it, but let's start at the top. Let's analyse where they went wrong and why it falls apart for me. The beginning of the show, like I've already been over, does a good job to establish Obi-Wan and Anakin, the guilt and the grief. Now, that should have been a basis for the entire point of the show. The flashbacks we see in episode one should have been just the start. We needed far more glimpses into their history that is character relevant. Maybe not right away, but certainly after the end of episode 2. At the end of episode 2, it's revealed to Obi-Wan that Vader is still alive. Sure, it's put across strangely and it's woven into Reva's arc as we ask, how does she know? But the reaction from Obi-Wan is brilliant. Now, this is where we needed much less time, probably with Reva, and more time with Obi-Wan. Use Qui-Gon, use brief flashbacks, show us the grief that's rattling him, show us how Obi-Wan is now more torn up than ever, how the anxiety is eating away at him. Give me depth. This show doesn't rest for long enough to give us a dissection of why Obi-Wan feels broken. We just know that he is. Does he feel it was his fault? Does he feel like he could have done more? Is he angry at Anakin? Does he resent Qui-Gon? These are all such interesting character threads that could have been explored, but the show goes for, oh, he's a bit sad. And that's really all we get. Anything deeper is inferred by the viewer choosing to infer it rather than being explored directly by the show's writing. If you were really exploring Obi-Wan's PTSD, his struggle with reconciling that Anakin is still alive, dealing with 10 years worth of guilt, you'd have to weave that into every single action he takes and make it clear why he's doing it. Going off to save Leia isn't enough. Show us why he's doing it, because he feels guilty for not being able to save Anakin, out of a selfish reason to do some good to save his own soul from the bad he feels he did to Anakin. Maybe he feels empty and it's a sense of duty and nothing more, and Leia will be the one to have him feel things again. Thread his broken and conflicted mental state into everything he does. That's how you make it a central pillar of the show's storytelling. It's how you turn episode 4 from a basic prison escape story with mundane action into an exploration of what Obi-Wan is willing to do for potentially his own selfish ends, saving Leia because he wants to try and right the wrongs he feels he did, and that he'll pick up his lightsaber again, but for the wrong reasons. Forced to out of guilt and hoping he can fix his broken heart by doing something good, but not out of a moral obligation. Learning that after saving 
leaving Leia, he feels just as broken, but a byproduct of that is Leia being able to show him the light again. Obi-Wan is saved by a Skywalker, and not just that, a Skywalker that reminds him directly of Padme, the last person to tell him there was good left in Anakin, giving him once again faith in Anakin that should be torn away by the end, but not in the way it was in Revenge of the Sith, in a way that leaves him without a doubt. Anakin is gone, Vader is left, but there is hope once again in a pair of Skywalkers, Luke and Leia. Now that's just one way you could take it to add depth, there's so many more valid ways to explore Obi-Wan and Vader in this show, but they just decide surface level and shallow observations are all that it needs to allow the plot to happen with not a lot to say otherwise. Let's talk about episode 3, because I think that's a moment that a lot of people were pretty disappointed with. I feel this is so bad that it actively harms their characters and episode 6. There is near to no build up to the meeting, there is barely any depth to character in this fight other than what have you become? I am what you made me. It's so surface level and it's nothing we don't already know. And the overall fight, this whole scene is... Uh, oh god. How did you not see him? You only saw him when he came into shot on camera? Was he not there before? You have Obi-Wan running around like a bloody headless chicken. It looks ridiculous. The editing here makes him look like he ran behind the rock and then just ran out again. Like, it's just illustrative of the poor directing and filmmaking in the show. He turns on his lightsaber and then turns it off again and runs away. It's just so funny. Who made this? It also, again, is an example of how they just don't want to light any of their scenes. Like, why did they set this fight in a quarry at night with no lights? It looks so visually bland and does nothing to make this interesting or exciting. Following this, we get the fire shenanigans. They did something interesting here. Vader's rage takes over. He wants to subject Obi-Wan to what he feels Obi-Wan subjected him to, so he drags him through the fire. Then he puts out the fire with the force and tells his troopers to grab him and then Tala who conveniently sprinted across town is there to shoot the fire again so Vader can't get to him and they escape of course though Vader just does what he did 30 seconds ago and puts the fire out what's that he, he doesn't why? It's another example of contrivance ruling the show over anything else, and that's their episode 3 conflict over with. There's not a lot of actual writing substance to analyse here because there is no depth to the fight, it's just an obstacle for Obi-Wan that happens to be Darth Vader. Episode 4 then proceeds to not even talk about anything that just happens and decides that it wasn't a pivotal point in Obi-Wan's arc that probably requires introspection. An action-packed episode derivative of Jedi Fallen Order is way more important. Episode 5, aside from all of the shooting and flat camera shots of Reva just explaining her old plan to the audience, is probably the closest the show gets to establishing some sort of internal conflict between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, using Obi-Wan and Anakin's relationship, although it is pretty shallow. The episode has flashbacks woven throughout. I've seen different people say this flashback was post-Attack of the Clones, so it makes sense to why they'd be training so hard with the Clone Wars on the horizon, but Anakin has his old lightsaber, so this is obviously sometime before Geonosis, where it gets cut in half, so... Not again. Obi-Wan's gonna kill me. Why they're training so hard and dangerously, I really don't know. I feel like this is a really odd way to train. The Jedi just do this. How many do they lose a year by having them spar with actual lethal weapons? This duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan reoccurs throughout the episode. As Reva reveals her plan and Vader gets closer, we get more and more of this duel. A duel that is trying to characterize Anakin's hubris and arrogance. His need to prove he is better than others. We know this because Obi-Wan says out loud what the scene is trying to show to the audience. But your need to prove yourself is your undoing. Until you overcome it, Padawan you will still be. Also, just completely off topic, but why is Obi-Wan's syntax here like Yoda? A Padawan you will still be. Why, why does he say it like that? Anyway. Now, this works. It's not inherently bad. If the rest of the show had something more to say, and this was taking place earlier on, it could really work well to build the show to something bigger, but it's not that. This is the most depth we get to their story and their conflict within the show. It explores a part of Anakin that isn't that interesting. We know Anakin has a lot of hubris. We know this partially is what led to his downfall. We know the one constant between Anakin and Vader is this hubris, and Obi-Wan uses that against him to help the rebels escape. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to see you and Don the Mullet and Hayden back as Anakin from Attack of the Clones rather than the obvious choices of Revenge of the Sith or Clone Wars. And I like how the flashbacks are used across the episode and woven into the story they're telling to give us a bit of character insight 
but it's really so shallow. And again, it's just a way of them justifying why Obi-Wan is able to help the Rebels escape from someone as powerful as Darth Vader, because he knows him. At the end of the day, it has very little to say on character, and what it does have to say isn't there to be explored, it's there to justify plot. Flashbacks could have been very helpful to the character story of the show. You could have used them in every episode almost if you had more time for Obi-Wan, Vader, and Leia without Reaver taking up a ton of screen time. You're left with a bunch of slots for flashbacks that help explore Obi-Wan and Anakin's relationship. Ways Anakin is similar to Vader, but also ways that he's different, which could give us some of Obi-Wan's inner conflict in trying to separate these two figures in his mind. It could show us that upon reflection, maybe Vader was always there, but that Anakin was always stronger than those impulses despite actions he may have taken, emotional, human actions that Obi-Wan can understand, it could help him come to realise in a final moment that Anakin and Vader are two different people because he's had time to reflect on their time together. From the beginning of the show, only seeing flashbacks to the Vader parts of Anakin, and the end of the show could be him seeing the parts of Anakin that were always more prevalent but that he's simply forgotten. You could do so much for character with more flashbacks of substance, but they do it once in episode 5 for an excuse at nostalgia bait and justifying the plot to direction with little actual character depth. So we come to the end of the show. The show decides that a fight needs to happen, and so a fight happens. There's some contrivances that get us there, but I have a section on that coming up after this, so hold your horses. After landing on an unknown rock planet, Obi-Wan and Vader have their confrontation. Obi-Wan at this point, of course, has had his shallow and almost non-existent arc and is ready to fight Vader. They do little callbacks to Revenge of the Sith, which I guess is nice. Obi-Wan does the pose, and it's cool to see, but it's not a substitute for substance, you know? I would love to see these things if they were in a story that gave a shit and had something to say, but it's just platitudes at this point in modern Star Wars. Now, there's a lot to say about this fight, both narratively and directorially. From a directing standpoint, I think it's visually unappealing and the lighting is the same as the rest of the show. Dull, dark, bland. None of the bombastic flavour we've come to know from the films, just another symptom of their budget being too low, I guess, although it was said each episode was $25 million, so I don't know where that went. Their shaky camera shots, poor over-the-head angles, wide shots that look so uninspired, it has the makings of a fan film. There's nothing here that says major Star Wars event. I mean, look at how they did Battle of Heroes. Mustafa was a brilliant planet to use. The environment is characterized as being part of the fight, both physically and emotionally. They move through a huge structure, climbing on broken parts, the lava churning up beneath them being a representation of the anger and rage and their bond being torn apart by Vader. It's beautiful, incredibly choreographed, and incredibly scored. This fight is none of those things. Maybe you could say the rocks signify Obi-Wan's newfound strength, he's rock solid, I, um, no, maybe not that. But it's a stretch, and I don't think it's anywhere near interesting enough to be justified thematically. The fact they didn't decide to use Battle of Heroes here as well is so odd to me. This show just holds back on music all around. Music is a key part of storytelling just as much as the writing and acting is. I'm not saying the original cut of Battle of Heroes would have been a perfect fit. I think you could change it up, make it slower, more dramatic, darker, a more mature version for this new fight between older versions of these characters, but use the leitmotif nonetheless. It's the track that is the conflict between Obi-Wan and Anakin. It makes perfect sense, and I'm baffled they didn't use it, yet they used it in the trailer. But more importantly, in the writing department, let's talk about this scene. Now, the fight itself is fine. It's good even, I guess. But for me, the issues come from what this fight should have been for the story. As bad as the prequels are in their approach to writing, Battle of Heroes works as a culmination of character over the course of three films. The films may be written poorly, but they have focus. They know they're about Anakin's fall to Vader and how that affects Obi-Wan. Mostly everything else is background, and so they do a decent job to show us Anakin and Obi-Wan together. From the first time they meet on Queen Amidala's ship to their banter in Attack of the Clones, fighting alongside each other, their time in Revenge of the Sith, and of course we have Clone Wars to do so much legwork for their characters and relationship. This all culminates in Battle of the Heroes. Everything so far has led to this battle. All of the writing, all of the investment, all of the focus of the prequels and Clone Wars gives us this battle in which Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi duke it out in a fight that is epic in scale and in emotion. It puts a cap on all of the stories thus far and pushes us 
onto the original trilogy. Now, this show should have told the story about Obi-Wan and Vader at completely different points in their lives to then culminate in a battle that meant something completely different for these characters, bridging the gap between the prequels and the original trilogy. The issue is that most of the investment I've seen online for this fight comes out of people's love for the prequels and Clone Wars. It doesn't come from their love of the story the show is telling, because the show has no depth. And so for me, who was looking for a fight that is totally recontextualized by the show's character work, I feel disappointed. Because this fight relies on your pre-existing investment in Anakin and Obi-Wan. It makes you see it as a Battle of Heroes 2.0, just way less visually interesting, rather than being the first time Obi-Wan and Vader truly duel. A fight that should take a whole show's worth of character work and conclude it the same way Battle of Heroes did for the prequels and Clone Wars. But because the show is so shallow, none of that needed depth is there, and the fight becomes pretty lackluster. If you have to fall back on, but you already had a character foundation in Revenge of the Sith, so the the fight is good, you know you have a writing problem, because the whole point of the show is to recontextualize their conflict in an interesting and insightful way. Okay, so surely I liked their final moment together, right? I can't possibly criticize that moment. Anakin. Anakin's gone. I am what remains. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Anakin, for all of it. I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. The same way I will destroy you. And my friend is truly dead. Well, no, I do think it's good. It's well written, well performed, and Ewan acts his heart out. The delivery from Anakin slash Vader and the voices being mixed and phasing between one another is absolutely chilling. In a vacuum, it's a moment that works. If you ignore the show that came before it and make up your own character arcs, then yeah, it works fine. My main issue is that it's derivative. It's Twilight of the Apprentice, but worse. If you aren't familiar with Twilight of the Apprentice, it's an arc in Star Wars Rebels that closes Season 2. There's a lot of moving parts, but one of the core threads is Ahsoka meeting Darth Vader for the first time. Ahsoka knew what Anakin became, but this is when she finally sees Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker. Even thinking about this is making me tear up a little bit. The reason it works is because we had so much depth for Anakin and Ahsoka, so much build-up, and then... Ahsoka left the Jedi. We never got a Battle of the Heroes for them. We never got any conclusion. She just left and is part of the reason Anakin fell so far. So finally seeing them together again, but Anakin so twisted and evil, it's heartbreaking. That moment when his mask is sliced open and Ahsoka sees Anakin inside, it kills me. His voice, it's Anakin in there. Ahsoka. Ahsoka. Anakin, I won't leave you. Not this time. Then you will die. The I won't leave you, not this time, hits you in the gut because it's the culmination of so much powerful character writing, and it's so much better than what Obi-Wan does. I have no problem with something being derivative of extended media necessarily, but it has to be better and this is not. It's a cheap version that, while kind of cool, it's got nothing on that scene with Ahsoka and Vader, and that comes down to the writing quality. If you still love it, that's totally cool, I'm happy for you, but think how much better it could have been if the show did anything using these characters with more depth than a shallow paddling pool. Also, a side note, but I do find it odd that Vader says this in episode 3, I am what you made me, and then says this in episode 6, You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. I just can't figure out the reason for each of these lines being the opposite sentiment when Anakin isn't really undergoing an arc here, he just is Vader and the show's purpose is to make that apparent to Obi-Wan in the audience. It's almost like his line at the end of episode 6 is there so he can close Obi-Wan's arc more than anything else. And the line in episode 3 is to throw some conflict into the mix that Obi-Wan can never dwell on but was probably supposed to. And look, I can't really talk about this fight without discussing how it ends. Obi-Wan just walks away. Now, I understand that the show can't have him kill Vader because the original trilogy needs it to exist, but just having him walk away? After he's come to the realization that Anakin and Vader are two different people, that his friend is literally gone, it's the perfect justification to just kill him. It's the perfect justification to do what he could never do on Mustafar. The actual logical thing for him to do here would be to kill Vader. The fact he doesn't 
is literally just for plot. It makes no sense at all for him to walk away here, and it's so funny to see him have this profound realization that his friend is dead and all that remains is this evil dictator killing machine, and then just walk away. The only way I can make sense of this in my head is that Obi-Wan just thought he was dead again, like that he would just, he would just die on his own. He didn't need to deal a killing blow, but that puts us back to square one. He has to learn again that Vader is alive and then train Luke to kill him, which is what he does. He tells Luke that Vader and Anakin are two different people in A New Hope. He doesn't want Luke to try and turn Vader, he wants Luke to kill Vader, so why didn't he just kill Vader? You should have killed me when you had the chance. You're so right, Vader. Very based. It's simply stupid, and it's something that comes up time and time again. Characters doing things because they have to do them, not because it makes any actual sense. The show runs on contrivance. Let's talk about contrivance. Why is it such a big deal? Well, when you're writing a story, the idea is to have your characters naturally deal with situations you present them with. A writer's job is to create consistent characters and then use the traits of those characters to solve issues presented to them in a way that is in keeping with their character and makes sense in terms of the story. Contrivance is when these issues are solved, not by a character's natural way of interacting with the scenario, but by sheer dumb luck. An example would be if you had your character searching for a needle in a haystack, a particular item in a big old wreckage, for example, that's been sitting there for, I don't know, 30 years in the ocean. And then your main character earlier found a dagger that has an extendable compass thing in its hilt, and when it's extended and looked at from the exact place they happen to be standing at that very moment, it points them exactly where they need to go. <sighs> that would be contrived. Star Wars is no stranger to contrivance, but Obi-Wan runs on it. When your story runs on contrivance, it means it no longer has any stakes. You start to realize as the audience that no matter what situation your heroes are in, they will inexplicably get out anyway. There is never any real worry, and even when there is worry, it's telegraphed to you so obviously that you see it coming a mile off. I could sit here and analyze all of the examples of contrivance, but there are so many we'd be here all day. So here are a few of the more egregious examples to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. When the Jedi in the saloon runs away, he uses force to pull down the shade thing out front, and the Inquisitors just... Oh no, now what? I don't know, man, maybe fucking walk around it. A 10-year-old running from grown bounty hunters in the woods who were stopped by thin branches. Just, just duck. Go around it. Are you dumb? At the end of episode one, Obi-Wan flashes his lightsaber to the camera all epic and the music swells, but for someone who's recently been in hiding and just saw a Jedi strung up in the middle of town, that seems like a really poor choice narratively, almost like it was done just to be a cool ending shot for the episode and doesn't actually make sense for him to do that, just lift up the other side of your robe, you fucking moron. At the start of episode two, a random lady gives Obi-Wan spice. The reason is because later on he needs the spice to get out of a tight squeeze. It's not the most egregious, but if he didn't have the spice, he would have been killed. So this random encounter literally saved his life. It feels like the writers did the whole episode and when they got to the end where Obi-Wan is cornered, they thought, ah, no, how do we get him out of this one? Should we rewrite? No, tell you what, what if 30 minutes ago he was just given some explosive spice? Genius. Another chase with Leia where a grown adult can't catch up with her because plot. Oh look, they conveniently miss all of their shots because they have to for plot reasons. If you need a main character to not be shot, don't put them in obvious line of fire, just obscure them more, it's really not that hard. Haja suddenly grows a conscience just in time for Obi-Wan to escape. Wow, what lucky timing, thank god. Without this inexplicable change of heart, Obi-Wan and Leia would have been captured again. Obi-Wan just sticks around to listen to Reva when he really should have gone with Leia. It's not like he's holding off Reva while Leia carries out a long process to start up the transport. It's ready to go. He literally just hangs around because the plot needs him to learn about Vader. It's definitely not the worst, but still, you could have easily made this work. On the transport in episode 3, the stormtroopers ask for Obi-Wan's story. He says it's a long story. They say, It's a long way. It's, it's not a long way, it's 1 minute and 17 seconds, and there's no cut here. Who the fuck wrote this? Oh yeah. Obi-Wan calls Leia by her real name despite insisting on them being undercover because the plot demands he be an idiot for this scene to build unnecessary tension with the stormtroopers, despite his years of service in the Republic Army, where I'm sure he had to maybe go undercover once. Well, I don't know though. Oh no! What do we do? It's, it's, a, it's a laser gate. I don't know, man, maybe fucking walk around it. Oh no, Obi-Wan might die. Oh, 
Thank God, the undercover rebel lady showed up just in time to save them. How incredibly lucky. Oh no, Vader's gonna capture- Ob Oh, thank God, the rebel lady showed up just in time to save Obi-Wan, just when he needed her. How incredibly lucky. And thank God, Vader can't just put the fire out for a second time. Man, that would have stopped the plot in its tracks. General, I'm sorry, but that's not my problem. Oh, well in that case, it's probably gonna take some serious convincing. Look, if you want my help, you got it. Oh. It's impenetrable, Wade. I don't see any shields. That's because no one would be stupid enough to attack them. Oh, oh no. <laughs> the classic not having clearance, but acting with authority so the guard lets you through rather than doing his only job on this base that has no shields. She kills this guy by grabbing his helmet. Oh no. In this corridor, thankfully, the stormtrooper just shoots the droid for some reason, then proceeds to walk towards Obi-Wan's stationary lightsaber, shooting at it so it deflects and he kills himself. I wonder how they'll get Leia out though. The base is on high alert and everyone is looking for a little girl and an old man. It'll have to be something pretty clever. Oh, the, the old, the old big coat trick. Oh my god. Oh no, they're completely cornered. I hope they don't die. Oh, thank God, the rebels showed up just in time. How incredibly lucky. It was underwhelming. I don't need your opinion. Did you try going in the vents to see what's going on? I'm a little too big to be crawling around in the vents. Man, if only we had a 10 year old who is really good with tech, but will inexplicably lose that skill in the next 10 years. <laughs> You know, I was following orders on Gorel. The Empire said it was a roundup. People not paying their way, taxes for the cause. They lied. There were four families, all force sensitive, and we, we gathered them up. Fourteen people died, and six of them were children, and I couldn't do anything to help them. So now I do this. Oh no, what a sad backstory. I hope she doesn't die. Oh, yeah, she's dead. I'm glad they took some time out to have Reva and Obi-Wan stand at opposite sides of a door and explain all of the exposition about Reva to us rather than weaving it naturally into the story. Incredible writing. I know Stormtroopers not being able to aim has been like a dumb, in-canon reason for stupid action sequences in Star Wars since 1977, but dude. Not one of them? Seriously? Haja just drops the important communicator Obi-Wan gave him that contains a message about Luke on Tatooine. Why did he give it to Haja? Why didn't Haja pick it back up? Maybe because there's no actual reason and the plot needs them to be really stupid here. Oh look, that's why he dropped it. Oh no, she's going after Luke. I'm sure hope she doesn't kill Luke Skywalker from Star Wars. Star Destroyers are apparently completely incompetent and can't hit a target. Didn't Han have to fly into an asteroid field to avoid a Star Destroyer once? This little ship just like weaves around out of the way. How did the Empire win anything with aim like this? Apparently, Owen and Baru are just badasses now. They have weapons on their farm and can hold off against Reaver, but are just murdered by stormtroopers who can't aim 10 years later. Also, I know I said I wouldn't really mention canon, but like... General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I... I don't think she remembers him. There are so many more examples. I had to really cut this segment down because it got stupidly long, like actually hilariously long, how many examples there are. I might do a longer cut one day on my secret hidden channel, or I might not for fear of becoming cinema sins. <laughs> but like I said before, the reasons these things matter is because it builds out a show's believability. If everything just sort of happens because it needs to happen, not because the characters naturally get us there, not because the situations are actually realistically dealt with, but by plot convenience and characters being stupid when they need to be, or really clever when they need to be, all it does is work to cheapen any story you're telling. Luck becomes the driving force, a thing that in reality, doesn't exist. You can have well-timed rescues once or twice, sometimes they're cathartic and satisfying if you've previously established a character might be on their way, but when your entire show runs on random characters just appearing when they need to appear, or things happening because they need to happen with no real rhyme or reason that works for character or story, then it becomes contrived beyond repair. And that's exactly what I feel happened to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ah, fan service. A touchy topic in 2022. Stands the world over, tune into the newest MCU and Star Wars properties for their long list of desired cameos. Waiting to do the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing meme. 
with every empty, thoughtless, shallow cameo thrown their way. Obi-Wan isn't the worst of the Star Wars shows, that obviously goes to the Book of Boba Fett, but it definitely plays into the very Rise of Skywalker-esque, let's look at what Reddit wants and do that without finding a way to make it serve a greater narrative or character purpose. It becomes fan service without depth or meaning. It's just a thing you recognise being on screen, and that's not gonna cut it for me. I'd take a whole story that's well written with entirely new characters and locations over a poorly written one with CGI Luke Skywalker. Now Obi-Wan has examples of fan service done correctly, because it's not always simply a bad thing to do in your story. You can do fan service well if it pays off an arc, characterises a person or location, or draws a parallel for a greater narrative strength. An example of that is the clone begging for change in episode 2. We get to see a clone Trooper, a reference to the Clone Wars, played by Tamuera Morrison, and that's cool, but it also works to flesh out the greater world. What became of these clothes that were used and discarded, that fought an entire war for the Galactic Republic, and then became cannon fodder for the Empire? You can see Obi-Wan feeling pity, but also probably a bit of fear. The last time he saw the clones, they were trying to kill him but he knows deep down they were also betrayed by Palpatine and the Empire. There's a joint sorrow there, and it works exceedingly well. Qui-Gon's appearance, however, is just 24 seconds of Liam Neeson saying some hocus-pocus bullshit about you were not ready to see me, Obi-Wan, but now you can see me because you've had an arc, Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan just saying hello there is a dumb reference to a Reddit meme that has no significance to the character whatsoever. Luke saying, I'm not afraid, is a reference to the time when Luke said, I'm not afraid. When it wanted to, the show got fan service right, then it decided depth didn't matter and they could simply cram in random cameos with no real substance to them being there at all. Qui-Gon was insanely underused as a character. I want to know what Qui-Gon thinks. He made Obi-Wan promise him he would train Anakin. Those were his dying words. Obi-Wan, promise me you will train the boy. Yes, master. He is the chosen one. He will bring balance and train him. I want to know what he thinks about Anakin, his fall, what he thinks about Obi-Wan as a master. Does he blame him? Does he reconcile that he was wrong about Anakin? There's so much depth waiting to be explored, but the show would rather focus on the poorly written Reva subplot. Seeing Qui-Gon just being there didn't do anything for me. It's not enough to wheel out Liam Neeson dressed as a Jedi. He needs to have meaning to the story being told. He needs to have character moments. There needs to be something to say worth bringing him back. If he's there for a short cameo at the End and nothing more than really what is the point other than trying to elicit this meme. Whoa, whoa. The use of Hayden was woeful. One wide shot, most of it him in a suit where you can't tell if it's him or not. One flashback scene interwoven across one episode and his face peeking out of the Vader suit at the end of episode 6. That is such a poor way to use this actor and have him return. There was so much potential to do more in a show that was longer with more focus or a movie that was tighter with more purpose. We maybe could have seen him used better, but this show just shoehorns him in and underuses him entirely within the narrative. And as a side note, what were the random frozen Jedi in episode 4? Was that just set up for a spin-off or comic? Like, Obi-Wan sort of reacts and goes, Oh no. But then it's never brought up again? Why was that in the show? Was it literally sequel bay or spin-off bay? What purpose did that serve in the show itself? absolutely nothing. Such a weird inclusion that didn't serve the story at all. References and fan service are not bad in of themselves, but they cannot be a substitute for substance in storytelling. Even brief moments like the end of Return of the Jedi with Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Anakin, while not entirely the same, is a moment where they appear as ghosts for a short moment before the camera cuts away. But it works into the narrative because it's a celebration. We see Anakin back for the first time in forever. Luke's won. Obi-Wan and Yoda are proud. It's a moment that is earned by the story and works to pay off character. It has something to say. You can do these things right. Obi-Wan just doesn't seem to want to put the effort in. This series that really should have been a movie needed to be a simple story with a heavy emphasis on character depth. Instead, it opts for shallow character work within a messy, confused, and convoluted plot that has nothing of value to say. As a kid who grew up with the prequels, who grew up with Anakin and Obi-Wan, it hurts that their return to Star Wars after 15 plus years is in a show that is somehow more shallow than the prequels themselves. This should have been the chance to take what was great about these characters and amplify it tenfold, to give us an introspective story for our characters about grief, loss, guilt, pain, and also hope. 
Instead, it gives us contrived plot devices pushing our inactive characters through a host of side quests to reach a climactic fight that isn't earned or conclusive to a well-crafted arc. It's empty, it's lacking, it has the look of a fan film, and worst of all, I can see so much potential. At every turn, for every character, I can see so many ways to make this show burst with actual meaning, but for whatever reason, they decided to do none of it. I can't see myself watching Star Wars for the foreseeable future. I'd already tuned out. I came back for this show. I came back to see depth added to my childhood. Instead, I got empty fan service and superficial character writing. I wanted so badly to love this show, and I really couldn't be more disappointed. And that is why Obi-Wan Kenobi is the show that killed Star Wars for me. But at least we get the Reaver spin-off show in Obi-Wan Kenobi Season 2, and if they don't give us a spin-off for Obi-Wan's Long Lost Brother by 2025, I will absolutely eat every hat I own. <laughs> I'm so over this franchise. <laughs>